Well, good morning. We're going to be looking at a passage in uh, 1 Kings chapter 21. There's a uh, verse in the epistle of James. He that knows to do good and doesn't do it, sins. Simple little statement. But he that knows to do good and doesn't do it, sins. You see, God is teaching us every day, every moment of every day. All the different things that come into our life are lessons for us to learn. Ahab, of course, is a character that we're going to look at today. And his dear wife, Jezebel. They had learned a lot of lessons. They had Mount Carmel experience. They had all these different things. And um, even in our everyday experiences, what God takes us through, we're supposed to learn that if we know what to do, we're supposed to do it. One of my dad's favorite expressions was, <laughs> whenever I would do something wrong, I can still remember him looking at me and saying, I thought you knew better than that. Simple to say, well, I did, but dad, I didn't do right, you know, and so uh, there were consequences for not doing right. But um, God holds us accountable for what we're supposed to know. I uh, was in the Air Force, and I was uh, airman last class or next to last class at one point, <clears throat> just starting out. And I was at a, a base down in Florida, Eglin Air Force Base. And uh, anyway, I uh, was supposed to fly from, from Eglin, which was down east of uh, Pensacola, Panama City, right in that area. Fort Walton Beach is where it actually was. And a straight flight from there due north to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, just 33 miles from my hometown. And the general, General uh, Robbie Burns, two-star general, he had a private plane. It was a military, of course, but for his use only. And it was decked out quite well. It was a four-prop engine, uh, DC-4. He had uh, four props. And uh, anyway, normally they had a flight with a C-47 or a DC-3, which was only a two-engine plane. And... Uh, that's usually what they flew in, but the day I was going to go up, we went in General Burns' plane, and boy, we sat in that. It was fantastic. It was just like a Cadillac next to an A-model Ford. And so we uh, rode up in that, and everything was fine, and I had some time with my dad and mom there, and I went back, and of course, General Burns' plane had already gone back, so now we got to ride in the Cannonball, which is a DC-3, and it was a tail dragger, so it tipped down like this, and. So there was a, the end of the flight, you had to do a U-turn over the Gulf of Mexico. And so because of that, you not only had to wear a parachute, but you had to wear a life jacket as well. So we were given these things as we got on. Well, I was a dental corpsman. I didn't know beans about putting a parachute on, but I'd seen a movie once with John Wayne in it. <laughs> and uh, when you put this parachute on, it was the seat of your aircraft with, with, with John Wayne. And so we're standing there, none of us knew how to put this on, there were 10 or 12 of us there and handed these things, we're standing there looking at each other like, how do you put this on? <clears throat> well, I, I, we were going to take off pretty soon, so I put this thing on and I strapped it underneath me, you know, so it'd be something soft to sit on, got my life jacket on and there was a lieutenant that just, ROTC, just graduated from some college, and so, of course, he had never seen those things before either. <laughs> he could have thought they were a gas mask. I mean, he didn't have a clue what to do with them. So he looked over at me, and so he strapped his on the way I did. And the other people saw the lieutenant put his on that way, so we all put them on the same way. Well, the major that was going to fly this thing, he walked sort of crooked because he'd been in every skirmish that ever came along. He had so many medals. <clears throat> He walked out and he saw all of us standing there like this. And he's looking us over like, well, words escaped him at that moment. <laughs> but anyway, he's looking around now to find the highest ranking individual there. Second lieutenant right next to me. Narrowed his eyes down. He chewed him out. He accused him of everything except murder. I mean, he was all over this guy's case. 
course, he couldn't look at her and say, well, this airman. <laughs> he couldn't say, well, this dumb lummox airman just showed him how to put it on. He couldn't say that. So he had to take the heat. Well, I made sure I slipped down and sat someplace, some distance off from the lieutenant when we finally took off. He said, that is not where you wear your, your parachute. He said, it's a chest chute. He said, do you know what would be hanging right straight up in the air if you wore that thing? <laughs> you want to know how you'd land? Well, anyway, he was working this guy over something fierce. Well, he was supposed to have known more because of his rank. Now, the Lord is very patient with us. Very, very patient. All of us can give account for that when we know what we're like. And we know how patient he's been with us. But then once we have given, been given enough information, we're supposed to live according to the information that we've received. And what we're going to look at today is uh, the information that both Ahab and Jezebel had and how they should have been living and they weren't. And so now we're going to see some of the consequences. Well, let's pray and then we'll go into the passage. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are, the way you love us and how patiently you deal with us. We thank you that you've forgiven us, and now you've given us a job to do, and we pray that we'll be faithful doing those things that you've trained us to do, that you've taught us through experience, through your word, and through example that we've seen in your son and through all the others that have gone before us, and some that are still with us. We pray, our Father, that we would cause you to smile when you see our life because we're living according to the light that you've given to us. So we ask your blessing on our time together as we look into your word, speak to our hearts, challenge us so that we'd be joyfully doing your will. We thank you in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. So last week we looked at uh, 1 Kings chapter 20 and we saw where that... Um, Ahab had been victorious twice when his uh, two uh, military campaigns against Syria. And he won both times on the hills and also in the valleys because of their believing that uh, the Hebrew God was the God of the hills and not a God of the plains. And so they fought him in both cases. In both cases, the Lord gave the victory to Ahab and his troops. And it was an outstanding victories both times. In both times, the prophet that told Ahab that he was going to win said, now you're going to know that I am the Lord. I'm the one in control, and so trust me. <clears throat> and so he saw he got the victory and everything like that, but that really didn't touch Ahab. He was still the same Ahab at the end of the battle as he was at the beginning of the battle. No praise given to God, just the fact that uh, that's life, I won, and off he goes. And so uh, at the end of that, when he came up with Ben-Hadad, Ben-Hadad came up to him and uh, the Lord had already determined what was supposed to happen to Ben-Hadad, but um, instead of doing what he was supposed to do, he did not kill him, he let him live. And a prophet came to Ahab and said, uh, because you have given this person this ability to go on and live, uh, it'll be your life for his and your people for his people. See, sometimes we think that God is too severe. God is just absolutely a terrible God because of the judgment that he gives on some people. Well, when we become holier than God, we've got a problem. God knows all of the facts. He knows all of the facts. We may know some of the facts, but God knows all the facts, and he's going to do right. He's not going to be unjust. He's certainly not going to be unloving. He's going to be very loving and very right, and everything he does is perfect. But sometimes we think that we can be kinder than God. We can be more gracious than God. And so we change what God says is supposed to happen to what we think is more loving. And what it's really called is disobedience. And that's a hard word for us. Because when we are doing what God tells us to do, and sometimes it is very, very tough. 
but it's obedience to God. And Jonah, of course, he was saying that God wasn't tough enough. He should have killed all the Ninevites. And so he was telling God he wasn't tough enough. King Saul was telling God that he was too tough. And so he was going to forgive people, even King Agag, and the best of the people, the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, the best of, because he was going to say that God was too tough. And so over the years, you've had a lot of people who have told God that he's either too tough or too soft, one or the other. But God is always just right. And that's hard for us to understand because when God brings a judgment on a people, say, that's so cruel. Well, when we get the whole picture and we're with him in glory, we'll understand that that was exactly what was supposed to have happened. And it did happen. But now here was Ahab when he had been Hadad right there. And these were the people that were causing all kinds of problems for Israel. And now he says, oh no, he's my brother. And they made a treaty. And so that's when the Lord sent a messenger to him and said, well, because you've done this, then your life for his and Israel for them. And so there's going to be a terrible thing happen to them because of what he did. Now we're in 1 Kings chapter 21. Sometime later, that would be after what happened, there was an incident involving a vineyard belonging to Naboth, the Jezreelite. The vineyard was in Jezreel. Probably, that's why he was called a Jezreelite. <clears throat> Close to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Well, Ahab said to Naboth, let me have your vineyard to use for a vegetable garden, since it is close to my palace. In exchange, I will give you a better vineyard, or if you prefer, I will pay you whatever it's worth. Well, <laughs> who's going to determine the worth? You're going to get a real estate man to come out and there's his property right next to the palace? What would be the estimate of the value of that property? Or is Ahab going to tell you what it's worth? Well, that's a whole lot different than if you remember Arona the Jebusite and King David arguing over the price. They were going the opposite direction. <laughs> David wanted to pay full price and Arona wanted to give it to him. Quite a bit different from what uh, we see going on here. Anyway, Naboth replied, The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. So Ahab went home, sullen and angry, because Naboth, the Jezreelite, had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. So he lay on his bed, sulking, and refused to eat. Now, if you look at the last verse of uh, the last chapter, it says here that uh, sullen and angry, the king of Israel went to his palace in Samaria. Sullen and angry, he went to his palace in Samaria. That's the last verse of chapter 20. And here we see that um, he lay on his bed sulking and refused to eat. And in uh, verse 4 it says, sullen and angry, because Naboth, the Jezreelite, had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father. So he had a little habit of being sullen and angry. This was uh, Ahab. He, he had not really learned to hear the word no when it applied to him. Now, there are some people that grow up like that. That's why I feel very importantly that uh, my children, the first word that they really learn is no. It, 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 that doesn't mean to know somebody. <laughs> that means you cannot do what you want to do. If they can learn that, that's very good because you see a lot of people out there on the street, they've never heard that. And so that's why they take a ball bat, a zip gun, a, uh, now they take an AK or something like that to show people that they don't like to hear the word no. And uh, turn on the news every night, how many shootings? They've never learned the word no. Someone says no to them. You want to be in my gang? No, you die. What is this? They've never learned the word no. Now here's the king. Now most kings never get to hear the word no because everybody's afraid to say no to the king. And so here's Ahab. He had these prophets. They kept coming and they kept saying no to him. 
he didn't like what was happening. In the next chapter is another situation with Micaiah telling him that he says, I hate that man because he never tells me anything good. He always told him the truth. Well, he couldn't have Naboth's vineyard, so he goes home, lays on his bed, refused to eat. Uh, let me see, he's a king. He'd probably be somewhere in his 30s, maybe 35 at this point. But he's acting like he's about five. He's got a fat lip, got his nose against the wall, he's pouting, and he's not going to eat. Well, well, his loving wife comes in. Verse 5. Wife Jezebel came in and asked him, why are you so sullen? Why won't you eat? Now, I don't know how he whined this out, but I believe he really had a whine. You know, people that have a nice fat lower lip, number two crow could roost on it. They come and they have a way of whining just right. And so I'm, I think he probably whined pretty good. Because I said to Naboth the Jezreelite, sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I'll give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. <laughs> I will not give you my vineyard. Okay, so he didn't want to sell. Jezebel, his wife, said, is this how you act as king over Israel? Get up and eat, cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So that question that she asked, is this how you act as king over Israel? Don't you know how you're supposed to function as king? You're the king, you do what you want to do. You take anything you want. You are the boss. You don't know how to act, I'll show you how to act. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, placed his seal on them, sent them to the elders and nobles who lived in Naboth's city with him. In those letters she wrote, proclaim a day of fasting and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people. But seat two scoundrels opposite him and have them testify that he has cursed both God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. Well, not much tact here. It's just a straight thing. I don't want you to get people that look honest. Get two scoundrels. Get the lowest life you can get. Good liars. People that are just going to look the part and uh, tell these lies about him that he's cursed both God and the king then take him out and stone him to death. Don't wait for the ruling to come down. He's guilty obviously because I said he's guilty. So kill him. That's the final message. So the elders and nobles who lived in Nabal city did as Jezebel directed in the letters that she had written to them. Well, no question about this. So where were the nobles in this? Do we really care about justice? Do we really care what is right? Certainly there would have been some of those nobles that would have known a man by the name of Naboth and that he obviously was somebody that had some character to him. But nobody even asked about that. You said that, okay, you want him dead? He's dead, no problem. They proclaimed a fast and seated Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Then two scoundrels came and sat opposite him, brought charges against Naboth before the people, saying, Naboth has cursed both God and the king. So they took him outside the city and stoned him to death. Then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. It's business as usual. Now, sometimes we may think that there's some corruption going on behind the scenes. This is nothing behind the scenes. Everybody was quite aware of the reputation that Jezebel had. So those nobles, they didn't say, well, maybe we should go and tell her that this is not a good idea. Do you want to be the one to tell her first? <laughs> Nobody wanted to go face Jezebel. <laughs> no way am I going to go talk to her. Maybe you go talk to her. No, why don't we just go ahead and do it? They did it. She had such a reputation you don't do what I say you're supposed to do, you die. I think there are mafia bosses that would fear this lady. 
she did what she wanted to do and there was nobody to tell her any different. As soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death, she said to Ahab, get up and take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite that he refused to sell to you. He's no longer alive but dead. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up and went down to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. Now, here's this person that had seen what happened at Mount Carmel. He had seen what happened in the two battles. And each time there was a specific reason why these things occurred so that he would know that God is the Lord. He's the Lord. He's the one in control of everything. Now all of a sudden, what's he thinking? Well, obviously, he fears his wife more than he fears God. Now, you know, all of us like to be pleasers of people. We like people to like us. But so many times we have a choice. Do you want to really be obedient to God or to fall in and fear people? There are some children, sometimes they end up doing drugs. And the dad may be very serious about telling his children, don't do drugs. And then all of a sudden, he finds out that his son is doing drugs. Now, son, I told you, you're not supposed to do that. He said, but dad, if you'd have seen that guy that came up to me with this joint and said, okay, here it is. Smoke it or I make mush out of your head. I don't care what he said to you, but you're not supposed to do drugs. He said, but dad, I'm telling you, this guy, he looks like a mountain. And if I didn't do this, I might not even be here now. Well, son, you're not supposed to. And so the dad stays on his case. And so finally the son said, but dad, remember the, not too long ago, we were going down the expressway, speed limit was 55, and you were driving 80. And I said to you, dad, why are you going so fast? I thought you said we were supposed to obey the speed limits because those are the laws that God designed. Said, yes, but you see that 18 wheeler right on my bumper? If I slow down, I'm a grease spot on the road. And so you were intimidated by the bumper of that 18 wheeler. And I'm not supposed to be intimidated by that guy, Man Mountain Dean, that's about to swallow me up. That's different. Is it different? Now you see, God doesn't have power over a bumper. That's where his power stops. It's okay to deal with people, but the bumper is something else. But I've got my children in the car. I don't know if you've ever seen those little diamond-shaped things. It says, uh, baby on board. What that means is you can drive as fast as you like because there's a baby on board. <laughs> I've been passed so fast by some of those ladies. There's this poor little guy strapped in the back. I think he's screaming because he's afraid the way that mom's driving. But I don't know that. But, <laughs> but you see, we have areas where these areas are where we're supposed to obey God. But these other areas, it's okay because this is different. It's not different. We're supposed to submit to the laws of the land. Now, when they say you can no longer teach about Jesus Christ, well, at that point we have to say, well, yes, we can. We can still teach about Jesus Christ because we're supposed to obey God rather than man. But usually the laws that we violate are because we fold under pressure. If the Christians were dare to stand up for what they say they really believe, this whole area would be different. Chicago would be totally different. US of A would be totally different. But the Christians fold when it comes to the very thing that Ahab and Jezebel and the people around them were doing. They're afraid to stand. People are afraid to stand up to crime. They're afraid to stand up to injustice. We fold. 
He got up and went down to take possession of David's vineyard. He didn't worry about what happened. He didn't know anything about all the relatives that were also killed. All the sons were also killed, by the way. Killed them all. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Now here was Elijah the Tishbite. He, remember he had fled? He had gone over 300 miles to get away from Jezebel. Now for some reason he happened to be back up there at Jezreel. After he had had that uh, encounter at the cave, the Lord brought him back up there and now here he is right there by Jezreel. Go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel, who rules in Samaria. He's now at Naboth's vineyard where he's gone to take possession of it. Say to him, this is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, this is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs licked up Naboth's blood, dogs will lick up your blood. Yes, yours. Wow. Wow. What a statement. Now you see, here is this man, Elijah. For a moment, for several moments, for several months, he hid in fear. But now God raised him up, pumped him back up, got him strengthened again, and now he's facing this man Ahab again. The one that had delivered so many messages to Ahab before. Now he's there again. So he goes and he says, Ahab said to Elijah, so you have found me, my enemy? <laughs> oh, let me see, when he was on uh, the other occasion, he came to him after he had uh, prayed and it did not rain for three and a half years. And he says, oh, you that troubleth Israel. And Elijah said, no, no, I'm not the one that troubles Israel. You're the one that troubles Israel because of what you're doing. And now here, this is a terrible way to greet people. You know that? Every time the prophet comes in, oh, you're the trouble of Israel. And now here he is, says, so you have found me, my enemy. I found you, he answered, because you've sold yourself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's boldness. That's boldness. He's going to take a stand. The Lord says, I'm going to bring disaster on you. I will consume your descendants and cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel. Slave or free, I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and that of Besha, son of Ahijah, because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin. Whenever we cause somebody else to sin, we've got a problem. And in Matthew's Gospel and several other places in the Gospels, it's better that a person be having a millstone tied around his neck and thrown into the sea if he causes one of my children to sin. And here was the king leading people to sin, to turn away from God. Here these people were supposed to be leaders of people bringing them to God. And each one of us, we've received spiritual gifts to lead people to God. To teach them, to show them what Jesus Christ is all about. So we have a responsibility to do here. And so here's Ahab. He had refused and he was so interested in his own things. Oh, if I could only have that for a nice little vegetable or herb garden right next to my palace, I wouldn't have to go so far to go over there to weed my garden like he's going to be weeding his garden. No, he just wanted that property and I want it. And since I want it, well, whatever has to happen. So, because you have provoked me to anger and have caused Israel to sin, you do not want to anger God. And also, concerning Jezebel, the Lord says dogs will devour Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Whoa. Dogs will eat those belonging to Ahab who die in the city, and the birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. I don't know if you have that picture or not, what that would be like. But um, at one point, there was an awful lot of fighting going on between the Muslims and the non-Muslims in the country of Chad. 
And in 1979, we went from a village called Mycilla, going over to Dobo where we'd lived. And um, it seemed like every village we went to, the fighting had either just taken place or had taken place just after we left and we were just missing the battles that were going on. We didn't know that until afterwards, until we came into one village and there was a lot of uh, disturbance there and we found out what had happened there. And then we were on our way to Doba. We didn't have any idea what would it, it would be like at Doba. But we had this terrible aroma that, uh, oh, it was just overwhelming. And uh, off to the right, there were a pile of bodies where these people had been killed and left out for the birds. And the bodies were just bloated in the heat, in the sun, and the birds were eating them. We were hoping our children wouldn't see that. Um, we had gone a little past that and all of a sudden somebody beating on the cab of the car and I stuck my head out and Nate said, Dad, did you see all those bodies over there to the right? And it turned out that the one that uh, we had seen um, that was quite large was this uh, friend of ours that uh, was the Muslim that had sold us our diesel fuel and our gasoline, but um, he supposedly had thoughts of trying to overthrow the government. And so they just took them out and killed them and left them to be uh, destroyed by the birds, the vultures, as they came in. And so it's just an absolutely dreadful thing to see all these bodies just laying out like that. Well, this is what God said was going to happen to the descendants of Ahab. I mean, you get the picture of what this is. This is a dreadful thing. And why is it happening? Disobedience. These people had chosen after seeing what God was doing. He gave them the kingdom. He chose them as his people. They knew who he was. And they turned their backs on him. You see, we take some of the things we call, well, it's not too serious, but I don't know that God really wants me to do this. We're sort of nonchalant with what God says. God is not nonchalant about the words that he gives us. He expects us to obey them. As someone said, uh, when he gave the Ten Commandments, those were not ten suggestions. These are called commandments, and he wants them to do them. And for some reason, we think, well, yes, that was then, but this is now. But what happened in the New Testament to Ananias and Sapphira? And all they did was just exaggerate a little bit about the amount of money they gave. Well, they lied. Well, lying can't be that serious. Can't be that serious? The father of lies? The devil. God takes it seriously when we know to do good and we don't do it. He wants us to be obedient. There was never a man like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. Well, we've always heard about a helpmeet, but this is a helpmeet in the wrong direction. Encourage him, urge him on to do evil. Like you do something and you're doing something that's wrong. Well, that was good, honey, but let me show you how to really do it wrong. Tremendous help. I always, uh, some reason I have to laugh when I get in this situation with uh, the ten plagues. When Pharaoh would bring in his magicians and Moses and Aaron were there and they turned some water, turned the Nile into blood. Well, the magicians came and some water that wasn't there, they turned that into blood too. And I'm thinking, like, <laughs> Pharaoh said, I don't want more blood. I want you to take it away. But they made more. And then they did frogs. Oh, yeah, we do frogs. And so they did more frogs. <laughs> I don't want more frogs. You know, but anyway, I think that would have been a trivial thing. Well, here we see something in that same vein where he was already doing evil and his wife urged him to do more evil. Urged on by Jezebel, his wife. He behaved in the vilest manner by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. When Ahab heard these words... He tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, 
and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. But he did not trust God. He came so close to doing everything you need to do to actually turn your life over to God, but he didn't do it. He was sorry he got caught. He was sorry for the results. He was sorry for the consequences. But he did not commit himself to God. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite. Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster on in his day, but I will bring it on his house in the days of his son. Well, now that doesn't mean that he became a believer, and we'll see, uh, if you want to read the next chapter, um, how he didn't even last very long at that. But let's just turn over now to 2 Kings chapter 9. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter 9. Verse 30. <clears throat> God keeps his word. Jehu is now king <clears throat> of uh, Israel. Jehu went to Jezreel. When Jezebel heard about it, <clears throat> she painted her eyes, arranged her hair, and looked out a window. Well, now, <clears throat> she already knew that God had said she's going to die by the wall of Jezreel. Why would you go to Jezreel? Everything that God said was going to happen has happened. So what this lady is doing is in your face, God, you are no one. This is direct rebellion. And so just because God says this is going to happen, that doesn't scare me. And I've seen people that say, well, if God is this person, what? Who is God? That's what Pharaoh said. Who is God that I should obey him? Well, he found out the firstborn died from the firstborn of Pharaoh in the palace to the child of that maid that was making cotton, that was spinning wool. Well, when people challenge God, these things happen. And so now when she heard that Jehu was coming, she goes in and paints up her face, gets her hair done right. I have no idea what that was all about, but to me, it's just an arrogant thing. Ranged her hair and looked out a window. As Jehu entered the gate, she asked, Have you come in peace, Zimri, you murderer of your master? Well, Zimri, you know, he was a king for seven days. And uh, there was a rebellion that he had. And uh, he killed the king. And then he was killed by his uh, nobles shortly after that. Seven days, actually. He looked up at the window and called out, who is on my side? Who? Well, two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, Jehu said. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot. Jehu went in and ate and drank. Take care of that cursed woman, he said, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. But when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. They went back and told Jehu, who said, This is the word of the Lord that he spoke through his servant Elijah the Tishbite. On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's body will be like refuge on the ground in the plot of Jezreel, so that no one will be able to say, This is Jezebel. Wow. Disobedience has consequences. These people knew what God had to say and what he wanted them to do, but they chose rebellion. He had done so many things to demonstrate he is the Lord. Now, there's not one person here today that has not seen enough evidence to determine who God is. He's the Lord. He's done amazing things in everybody's life right here. Amazing things, wonderful things, things that are praiseworthy. But somehow or other, there are certain times when, in a sense, it's like we reach in our pocket and we flip that spiritual coin and say, well, yes, I know that. 
But I think in this particular case, this would be the best thing. Be very careful. We want to make sure that we make that decision based on the word of God. You see, there are certain things in scripture. Um, <laughs> they sort of haunt me. In that verse that I've given, he that knows to do good and doesn't do it, sins. Wow. We know what we're supposed to do in so many cases. But boy, oh boy, those people. Mm. Like this one guy, he said, well, I love my job, it's just the people I hate. And uh, sometimes that can be the case. We can love some relatives sometimes too much. Call that loving them too much? No, if we love them too much, all we would do is share the word of God with them and have truth with them. But sometimes you want to bend the word of God to fit some circumstances. We can't do that. Verses like uh, children, Obey your parents. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. Wives, submit to your husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Specific instructions given in the word of God. Now we know these verses. Well, if, if my wife would submit to me, I would love her like Christ loved the church. And the husband says, well, if my wife would submit to me, I would love her as Christ loved the church. And, and we always have these stipulations. If this were to be the case, that's not what it says. It says, do these things. I happen to have a Weber grill at my house. It's bright red. It's almost 50 years old. I didn't know the company was that old. It's almost 50 years old. I got it when it was about 25 years old. There's a couple that uh, their children gave them this Weber grill. And so she said, uh, so uh, if you'll uh, put that grill together, I'll plan a party and uh, we'll cook out. And he said, well, if you plan the party, I'll put the grill together. And she said, well, you put the grill together first and then I'll plan the party. He said, no, you plan the party first and I'll put the grill together. 25 years, they didn't do anything with the grill, still in the box. That's when they gave it to me. They said, well, maybe Dick will get this grill together. Well, I put it together. I know what to do with the grill. I put that grill together and we've been grilling on it now for over 20 years. Invited them out. <laughs> Had them over for a, a grill for, from their grill a few times. They've been married now for 70 years. She hates every day of her married life. That's what she told me. And he hates the way that she treats him. 70 years, I would think that they would get together at some point in time and say, can we make peace and enjoy our life? No, they enjoy fighting. Now, if I say something to them about wives, <laughs> submit to your husband and everything, you can't even imagine the beautiful look I get from this lady. I can't even see her eyeballs. Husbands, love your wife. Christ loved the church. They've been in assembly fellowship for about 75 years or 80 years in assembly fellowship. Can't get along with each other. Argue every day. Now, I'm only saying this for the simple reason that we have a choice. We have a choice. We can either really enjoy what God has given us or we can be rebels. Now because God doesn't absolutely send fire and brimstone to consume us when we're outright rebellious, doesn't mean he doesn't like it. Doesn't mean he approves of it. He hates it. You see, the marriage is a picture of Christ in the church. And what picture is he giving to those two sons? 
who have a real problem in that area. We're supposed to be giving a picture of Christ's love for the church. The way that she submits and the way that he loves. But we choose not to do that for some reason. Some selfish reason. Oh, he's blessed us. So many blessings. And yet what we do, we finagle. We find a way that, well, that's what happens under these circumstances. And it's easy for you to say. Or you, <laughs> it is easy for me to say, but it's not so easy necessarily for my wife to say. But anyway, I'm just telling you that it's very important that we get the picture of what God says. Now, it doesn't say, now, obey me when I tell you to do what you want to do. It says, do these things. And then, there's blessing. Now, he's given us so many blessings, we can't even count them. And were we to start, it'd be embarrassing. Because we had forgotten some of the blessings that he's given to us. But we see the results of disobedience. And they're severe. Disobedience has a severe consequence to it but he expects us to follow him and when we do tremendous blessings looking at that time when he's going to have his arms outstretched well done good and faithful servant you've been faithful in a few things i'll make you ruler over much enter thou into the joy of the lord to hear that what can be greater than that we say that's very important to us so the steps to that very moment is obedience let's pray our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us beautiful pictures in your word telling us how to live, how we're supposed to demonstrate your love to other people, especially those very close to us in your family, ones that you brought together with us. Help us, give us the courage to stand that we would not fold. Now we just thank you, we praise you in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.